good afternoon or good morning to everybody, uh, depending on where you're connecting from. Um, my name is Kimana Zulueta Fulsha, um, and I'm the acting head of International Ideas Constitution Building Program. It is really such a pleasure to welcome you all to the third edition of International Ideas webinar series on constitutional design innovations. Uh, with these series, as you know, we're trying to identify and discuss um, innovative constitutional design approaches, mostly focused on um, institutional design, but also on ways in which these institutions may be able to respond to some of the new and upcoming challenges uh, that we're facing today. Um, let me perhaps just very quickly introduce International IDEA uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with this institution. Um, International IDEA is an intergovernmental organization with now 34 member states, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, and we have the sole mandate to support democratic institutions and processes um, around the world. Uh, our headquarters is in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, our program on constitution building is based in The Hague, Netherlands, but we have offices in 10 countries and more around the world. And we focus mainly on supporting elections and election management bodies, um, parliaments and political parties, um, and of course, peace and constitution building processes. Now, today we will be talking about the role of constitutional media commissions um, in addressing both disinformation and misinformation and, and advancing a balanced media coverage. Um, and of course, <clears throat> disinformation and misinformation are very highly complex phenomena compounded, of course, by an increasingly globalized and interconnected world, um, the diversification of media channels from newspapers, radio, television to internet and social media has meant that the general public can share but also receive any type of information and disinformation all the time and, and must. And disinformation and misinformation do actually represent uh, critical challenges to democracy in general, but also to peaceful coexistence on the one hand, or even to nascent processes of reconciliation in many contexts that are actually attempting to break away from conflict dynamics. And of course, the debate is longstanding about whether or not the use of social media or large companies controlling the use of social media should be regulated and how, and what national governments as well as intergovernmental organizations can do about this phenomenon. Um, our intent in this webinar is a bit more limited and that we want to examine the way in which national constitutional media commissions are able to deal with the spread of misinformation and disinformation and also protect or counteract citizens accessing and also acting on behalf of this type of information and ultimately perhaps even undermining nascent um, as well as developed democracies. And we will be looking at four different cases, four very interesting different cases, including uh, these types of commissions in Ghana, in Armenia, in Poland, and in Tunisia, uh, both their membership and their mandate, but also ways in which they might have adapted uh, to this technological revolution that I was talking about. And so my colleague Adam Abebe will moderate the session today and will also uh, give some introductory remarks, and he's joined by an excellent panel uh, that I will very briefly introduce, um, starting with Professor Kwasi Prempe, a renowned comparative constitutional expert and international advisor, um, and also the executive director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development. Um, Professor Miroslav Robleski, uh, director of the Constitutional, International and European Law Department at the Officer of the Commissioner for Human Rights in Warsaw, Poland. Professor Hajer Geldish uh, of the University of Karta, head of the Research Master in Law and Policy of the African Union and also elected member and general rapporteur of the African Union Commission on International Law. And last but certainly not least, Boris Navasardian has had a long career as a journalist in Armenia and is uh, the president of the Yerevan Press Club, the first independent association of journalists in Armenia since 1995. So welcome to you all. Um, I very much look forward to your presentations and of course to the discussion that will follow. And Adam will take it from here. Adam, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Kibana. Um, I, want, I want to also thank the, the, the panelists. Um, we really, really appreciate your time. I also want to thank the audience. Um, we, we had quite a large number of registrants, so they will be streaming in as, as we speak. 
Um, so, so we were just speaking before this that you know this is an, an opportunity and challenge that the new world uh, or the new technologies present. Um, so, as, as Kimana said, so th there is a shift. There's a fundamental shift from an era of offline world, the offline world, to an, an era of an online world. Um, and then this has obviously brought about its own challenge, uh, it, its own uh, opportunities and, and, and challenge. And in, in particular, we live in an age of, you know, most recent ones, and we live in an age of deep fakes and, and micro targeting um, and Donald Trump's favorite word, fake news. Um, so so, so there's, there's this particularly in terms of misinformation, in terms of disinformation, um, the, the new technologies have essentially collapsed the, the barriers to communicating to a, a mass audience. No limits in terms of geography, um, no limits in, in terms of reach. Um, and, and, and so what we want to discuss today is how and what constitutions can do about, about the challenge that, that disinformation, uh, that misinformation represent, and also the challenge of ensuring balanced coverage, balanced media coverage, uh, and, and what can constitutions do um, about that? And in particular, we wanna discuss uh, one um, innovation, uh, you know, we've called them media commissions, but they have different names in different places. Um, but what is unique about them is, is if you, for instance, look at the media commission in Ghana, uh, it was made in the era of, in the offline era. And, and, and now it is, it has to address the challenge of an online era. Uh, and so what we want to discuss today is whether, you know, there's this idea, at least in, 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 the, in the human rights world, there's this idea or preference to the idea of self-regulation. Uh, or self-moderation for, for the convince, conventional media. Uh, but obviously that has, at least in my opinion, not worked. Um, and so what can these media commissions do in terms of first addressing the challenge of disinformation, misinformation, uh, but also in terms of ensuring better, more balanced, and more comprehensive uh, media coverage. Um, and, and in that regard, we also wanna discuss, and, and this is our, the, our constitutional angle, um, what does, does, does the constitutional status of these commissions, does it give them an advantage or does it disadvantage them in terms of the discharging these two fundamental objectives uh, within the broader framework uh, of, of advancing media freedom? Um, we have an illustrious panel um, and you know, countries with very, very interesting stories to tell. Unfortunately, we have to limit the, the presentations to 10 minutes. Um, but we're going to go first to Professor uh, Kwasi Prempa, um, who will tell us about the, the Ghana Media Commission. And, and it would be very interesting to hear briefly about the, the commission itself. Uh, and, and, and secondly, how they have tried to challenge the, 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 to address the challenge we mentioned, and, and importantly, how their constitutional status plays uh, within the broader framework. Uh, Kwasi, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and good afternoon uh, here from Accra. So uh, the, the Ghana constitution has been in force since January 1993, which is when Ghana transitioned to democracy after uh, about a decade of military rule. And uh, in this constitution, which is the fifth, uh, fifth constitution since independence in 1957, there are the usual uh, standard provisions guaranteeing uh, the right to freedom of speech and expression, uh, which includes uh, in this constitution is defined to include the right to freedom of the press and the media. But in addition to that, there is a separate chapter, a whole new chapter in the constitution, chapter 12, which is devoted exclusively to freedom and independence of the media. That's how it's titled. And in this chapter of the constitution, there is provision for the establishment by an act of parliament of a 15 member national media commission. So this is the commission where we're talking about. And the statutes that uh, implemented this constitutional provision was passed uh, during the very early years of the new constitution, which is in 1993. Now, you, you have to note that this comes against the backdrop of a history of state owned and government controlled media. Uh, prior to this time, 
there had not been any private me uh, broadcast media. We have had private press in Ghana predating the National Media Commission, but no private broadcast or electronic media. The first one appeared uh, in 1995, which is after the constitution had come into force. So not only was the National Media Commission uh, created against the backdrop of this offline, as, as Adam called it, offline uh, mode of communication, but it was also against the backdrop of exclusively state-owned broadcast media. Um, this, of course, has all changed uh, in, in more recent years. I think my most current numbers, um, Ghana has about 137 television stations, 629 authorized radio stations. I mean, this is for a population of about a little over 30 million, right? So it's, and the state-owned media, while it continues to operate, is actually has uh, an incre increasingly diminished share of the market um, uh, in terms of the, the audience market in the media. Now, the National Media Commission is established as one of the uh, autonomous or independent commissions under the Constitution. So it has the standard uh, provisions for independence from the government. It, its membership, is, is, its composition is dictated by the Constitution. The, an overwhelming majority of the members are uh, not appointed by government, are nominated by specifically named uh, civil society and other professional bodies and uh, religious bodies. Uh, the government, uh, I think the government president nominates, president appoints two, parliament, uh, which is multi-party, uh, nominates three out of the 15. So um, they are definitely in the minority. And the commission members get to choose their own chairperson, which in the Ghanaian cultural context <clears throat> is significant because chairpersons tend to assume uh, disproportionate powers uh, within our context. And then the National Media Commission, the constitution makes clear that the commission also is to be subject only to the constitution, not to be subject to the direction of any person or authority. The members have a, um, a three-year term, a renewable ones, so there's a two-year term limit. Uh, the, 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 the political half of the state, the president and parliament are four-year terms. So the, the, the term of the commission uh, tends to overlap uh, the, the regimes. The, the main functions of the commission, uh, again, looking at it against the backdrop of the history of state-owned media, is to insulate state-owned media from government control, number one, to take measures to ensure that persons responsible for state-owned media afford fair opportunities for presentation of divergent and dissenting opinion, to promote and ensure freedom and independence of the media, and to take all appropriate measures to ensure highest journalistic standards in the mass media. So these are the four main uh, functions of the media commission as enumerated in the constitution and the statute. There, is all, there are also two companion provisions here that are important in the constitution. Now, so Article 55, Clause 11 in our constitution states that the state shall afford fair opportunity to all political parties to present their program to the public by ensuring equal access to the state-owned media. And uh, Clause 12 says all presidential candidates during elections shall be given the same amount of time and space in the state-owned media to present their programs. And the Media Commission is also the one that enforces these other two companion provisions of the constitution. Um, in, you know, in assessing the Media Commission, um, essentially the Media Commission so far, uh, when you look at uh, how it's performed, it's been generally successful in protecting editorial, editorial independence and autonomy of state-owned media. That has been very good at doing because it has managed to ward off attempts by government to revert to the old model, uh, which is state-owned and therefore government control. So while we continue to have state-owned media, the element of government control has been, I think, quite successfully muted by the National Media Commission. It's managed to actually get the government, uh, keep the government away from trying to influence, I mean, dictate the appointment of editors to state-owned media and the like. And this was part of um, the outcome of the very first successful lawsuit 
that the media commission won against the president in 1990, I think six. So they've managed to do that very well. They're, even in that area, however, they remain, because the government continues to own the state's interest, there are challenges uh, where it comes to, you know, the line between ownership and control. Uh, for example, the government has attempted sometimes to divest or sell parts of its interest. Uh, and the, the media commission has resisted almost on the theory that there must be some state-owned media. It, the constitution presumes that there must be state-owned media and therefore the government can just divest its ownership. So there, there, this, that's an uh, ongoing battle. In the area of journalistic in, independence, uh, integrity and professionalism, that has been a, a, a little bit more contentious. And that's where we get into regulating conduct and content, uh, misinformation, fake news, other things. The uh, NMC attempted um, in 2000 and I think 14 or thereabouts to enact broad regulation, some content, uh, some broad broadcasting regulations which uh, would have affected content. That was challenged by the, the owners of independent broadcast uh, uh, media uh, and the Supreme Court ruled that in fact those regulations constituted unconstitutional prior restraints. So that has, since that time, uh, the, the media commission has been disabled essentially from regulating broadly uh, conduct and content uh, in the media space. What this has been limited to doing is essentially using a statutory uh, complaints procedure to uh, you know, adjudicate administratively complaints that are brought against uh, media and journalists for by particular either individuals or usually by government officials and government for things that are said on or published by these uh, media houses. So there is, there is that um, process. It is not compulsory that you use that process, but once you use it, the law requires that you exhaust that pro uh, NMC process before you can have recourse to the courts. And that you, you have found a number of journalists and media houses have been, complaints have been lodged against them before the media commission for various things that they have published. And the media commission has the power to, um, uh, the orders that it can impose include uh, retraction, correction, apology, a right to rejoinder, and sometimes uh, it has never done that, but it can also impose some form of disciplinary action if there is a violation of the code of ethics of the particular professional uh, group. The media commission, I mean, the, the mandate of the commission extends not only to complaints against journalists or media houses, but also complaints by journalists and media houses against government. On that second leg of its uh, mandate, though, it's been uh, quite powerless. Uh, there are a number of uh, complaints uh, lodged against government in the in not before the commission, but generally attacks against journalists uh, have increased uh, in more recent years, and the media commission has generally been powerless to to act in those cases. The one area that I think also implicates the subject matter of this conversation is pluralism and and again disinformation and the like. The media commission is not the only player in this space. While it is the constitutionally mandated body um, uh, uh, we're talking about here, there is also established by statute a national communications authority. That is not an independent constitutional body, but it is directly responsible for the allocation of spectrum and therefore for the regulation of the operations, the technical and other operational aspects of radio and, and of television and of electronic media, which is, um, which is uh, social media and internet. So in addition to the NMC, and I don't think that anybody could have contemplated at the time the NMC was being, the uh, provision, provision was being written, it was not contemplated that we would be in this, in this era. Maybe if it had been contemplated, then a different kind of regime, a regulatory regime would have been, would have been provided for. But, very early on in the, in the life of the constitution, as I said, the private media evolved. And for them, there was initially one that attempted to evolve without license and, and was stopped. 
on the theory that you needed, you know, the spectrum was a public resource. It had to be allocated. It's a scarce public resource. Had to be allocated in some orderly fashion. And that was the basis for establishing the National Communications Authority, which has now become a competitor um, uh, institution to the National Media Commission. The National Media Commission, therefore, doesn't really seem to have a lot of role when it comes to the pluralism in the general media space. It can ensure pluralism in opinion, diversity of opinion within state-owned media, but in terms of how pluralistic and diverse the whole media space turns out, it's the National Communications Authority and how it allocates the spectrum that determines that. And that has been really there's this jurisdictional and the jurisdictional fight between these two bodies. So we, we have a situation, for example, where the National Media uh, uh, Commission has been powerless in the face of the National Communications Authority shutting down certain radio stations uh, on the grounds that they had violated the terms of the alliances and had not missed a certain statutory obligations like payment of fees, payment of taxes and the like. You know, and, and that included recently a very prominent opposition radio station. And also the general ownership rules uh, regarding uh, spectrum ownership are pretty lax. So you have had a situation where there is huge concentration of media in the hands of politically or party affiliated radio stations. And so you've had that kind of a situation. So the NMC in Ghana really, uh, as far as with, in terms of disinformation and, and misinformation goes, because it has been so far prevented by, 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 by the Supreme Court from enacting broad regulation of that area, it has had to resort to just case by case uh, complaints, uh, triggered uh, adjudication, uh, so to speak, in order to deal with that problem. Its, its ability to really regulate this information on that broad scale uh, uh, is currently almost, almost uh, not there. I understand that. They're still working, they're, they're, they're trying to work through a new set of regulations. They've come to some kind of an understanding with the National Communications Authority, and the two are trying to cooperate to see if, uh, you know, they recently announced like a, a, an MOU between them, trying to see what, uh, who is who when it comes to regulating uh, this area um, of, of misinformation, fake news, and the like. Uh, during election time, uh, the National Media Commission has done a lot more work, uh, mostly following on the heels of civil society. They've done a lot more work in this area, uh, trying to regulate um, speech, but it's normally by moral suasion. They publish um, a list of violators, a list of media houses that are basically churning out offensive material and that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of fact checking uh, also done by civil society, prominently the West Africa Media Foundation, which is based in Accra. That's a lot of fact checking uh, of these things. But the commission itself uh, so far has, has had very little uh, influence on that space by the very nature of the structure and its mandate. And more and more, the National Communications Authority, which is regime controlled, is the one that looks like able to assert that authority. It hasn't yet used it to, to, to regulate fake news or, or misinformation, but it has used it uh, to regulate the nature of diversity and the structure of the industry. I'll pause here, maybe my 10 minutes are up, yes. and then we can, we can have a discussion later on. Um, no, th th thank you very much, Prof. I think um, you make a very, very interesting point. Um, perhaps what I could imply from this is that the fact that the constitution was adopted at a particular time meant that the mandate of the commission was, was restricted, right? And that then gave uh, unscrupulous politicians to set up an alternative <laughs> competitive structure that they have more control over, right? So I think I guess there is an element of weak institutional design um, that, that kind of played into, into the, the, the hands of the politicians. Uh, but very good to hear at least that it's playing a significant role in terms of ensuring that there's balanced media coverage at least uh, from from uh, institutions that are sponsored and funded with 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 taxpayers' money. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll, I'm sure there will be there will be questions, and we'll come back. Um, and I have started to be uh, lax with time, so um, I will try and give you more time, uh, the rest of you more time as well. Um, 
And now we have uh, Professor Miroslav uh, Urobluski. Um, sorry, my, my Polish is, is very, very bad. Uh, but thank you again for joining us. And uh, Poland also has a similar commission um, and it's newer. And it is also one of the countries where that has at least, you know, from media coverage and all has challenged, has faced the challenge of both uh, of, of balanced media coverage, but also potentially of, of, of misinformation and disinformation. So, uh, Prof, tell us, uh, you know, how, why, you know, what, what, tell us a little bit about the commission what its constitutional status has meant, has it protected it, has it allowed it to discharge its functions, um, particularly in terms of disinformation and misinformation. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. I can assure you, uh, your pronunciation of my name is very good. So uh, you, maybe you can try with uh, Polish uh, generally. Uh, so uh, to, to, to be brief, uh, 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 I, I, I will present uh, an outsider's uh, view because uh, I, I work uh, for the Commissioner for Human Rights, which is the Ombudsman Institution, this is the, the Universal Institution for the Protection of, of Human Rights. Uh, I've been working for years also for media and uh, uh, radio and press, but I never worked for the Media Commission, so uh, uh, my, th therefore I, I uh, this is the outsider's view. However, uh, uh, I can say that uh, maybe a, a, a short historical background uh, 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 is uh, maybe uh, will be valuable um, that uh, with the end of communist uh, era uh, in 1989, uh, we uh, shifted to, to uh, free democratic society, uh, uh, leaving behind uh, state-owned uh, radio and television, and in uh, probably 95% also uh, state-owned press. Uh, 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 Poland under the uh, communist regime uh, uh, had also an office of censorship. So this is a for, this, this was a formal censorship uh, regarding uh, all media, culture, and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, information. So therefore, this was a state organized. A disinformation system. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, it was not about uh, uh, producing uh, fake news, uh, but about uh, uh, keeping in shadow those information which were not, uh, I would say, uh, good for the government. Uh, so, Therefore, uh, the, the initiative of Gorbachev with uh, Guasnost, yes, the transparency of the regime was probably one of the main points of the system, system collapse. Uh, the true uh, or how the system operated was uh, 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 not very profitable. Uh, for communists to, to be very diplomatic. Uh, with the constitution, new constitution of 1997, uh, you rightly said that Poland gained a new uh, institution, uh, the National uh, Radio and Television Broadcasting Council. Uh, so as you see, this is a council independent, uh, constitutionally mandated institution protecting uh, freedom of information, uh, freedom of speech, and safeguards, uh, uh, which safeguards also the generally how the constitution says uh, public interest uh, as regards radio and television. There is no uh, 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 organization uh, as regards the press or other kinds of uh, media. The self-regulation initiatives are present, but are, they are very weak. So I'd rather say uh, there, is, there is no such uh, uh, self-regulation system. 
uh, of course, uh, it determines uh, the, the strengths and rather weaknesses uh, uh, in uh, that, uh, that area. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, the, the, so the, the National Broadcasting Council was and is responsible for public uh, media. And actually, it, it is a, a decisive, it was for many years a decisive body because then uh, the uh, council uh, elected by uh, parliament in two thirds and the president in one third uh, nominated uh, in kinds of uh, buffos, so in a competition organized method and members of boards and supervisory boards of uh, um, public television and radio companies. So uh, 16 voivodeship uh, uh, radio and television companies and uh, uh, were uh, countrywide uh, 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 television and radio. Uh, but uh, uh, actually uh, in 2015, uh, the right-wing governments of uh, law and justice uh, sized uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, political power, and they decided to circumvent the constitutional body by establishing a new council, uh, a new council which is 100% uh, uh, controlled body by, by currently ruling politicians, uh, National Media Council, the, the name is similar, uh, it's composed directly by the deputies. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a body uh, nominated by, by the parliament. And therefore, uh, there is no competition uh, system, but it is a, a direct transmission of the political will uh, to the national new national media council uh which uh, uh, elects directly uh the, the presidents of the of the uh, television and radio uh, companies and uh, 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 it is uh, said to say that uh, especially uh, public television uh, plays a major role uh, in proliferating uh, uh, government policies uh, but not uh, impartial uh, information. So uh, many people compare the main news channel to the old uh, news uh, from the communist times. Of course, it is the content is totally different, uh, but the uh, totally uh, totally uh, one uh, side of the political seen is, is present, the other, when present, is uh, always criticized. And uh, uh, it is uh, the system which is, uh, uh, which violates violate constitution. Uh, I can say it because uh, this is the, it was the motion of the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, which declared, uh, the Constitutional Court declared such an organization of the uh, uh, legislation as being unconstitutional. Unfortunately, the parliament and the government did nothing uh, as regards implementing the system. And even the, the National Broadcasting Council stayed uh, uh, silence uh, for, for, many, for many years. Uh, it is even more that uh, uh, government uh, finance uh, smearing campaigns uh, uh, against uh, uh, judges. Maybe you, you are aware on the rule of law crisis in Poland regarding judiciary, organization on, of the judiciary. And it was uh, uh, a publicly financed foundation uh, which uh, organized uh, uh, this campaign. And, which is, uh, you, you can say it's, it's, it's a paradox that uh, a public television being criticized 
for this one stream uh, uh, attitude uh, can bring it to the court. So uh, actually uh, public television tend to react with uh, slaps uh, being financed from public resources. Uh, they can of course afford big law firms and prosecute uh, the critics, uh, including including the the former the former ombudsman. Um, so this is uh, something which uh, goes uh, far beyond imagination. Uh, I think we we've uh, we've had for for many years. Uh, I can say that also uh, 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 this is quite a. Um, Mm, uh, uh, I, I, maybe this this uh, notion will be repeated uh, today uh, many times. But as regards pandemics and COVID nineteen, uh, the government plays on two pianos. Uh, one, uh, of course, uh, uh, they educate that vaccination is important. But uh, uh, from uh, many politicians uh, value the, uh, the freedom of uh, decision. And uh, uh, such, uh, I would say, um, the, the disinformation uh, uh, connected with vaccination uh, resulted in only half of Polish society being vaccinated. And uh, uh, we uh, reach uh, currently up to 500 death tolls per day, uh, uh, which is, a, a, of course, horrible thing. I can continue. I, I, I already crossed the, uh, the time limit. Of course, there are some initiatives by the National Broadcasting Council. Uh, they commission reports regarding the fight with uh, disinformation. Uh, the council uh, tends to, to uh, implement uh, EU direct audiovisual directive. Uh, just yesterday, uh, a declaration on the media education was signed together with the Minister of Education. But I have an impression that there are much more formal and uh, bureaucratic uh, activities than the real will to fight disinformation uh, and misinformation. So I will stop here. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, indeed, I think, you know, I, I don't want to create parallels, but I think there is some connection, uh, just like in, in Ghana, the um, you know, despite the presence of a constitutional entity that has actually not stopped uh, some political groups from setting up parallel entities that either duplicate and even sometimes undermine, actively undermine the mandate of the constitutionally established institutions. I think this, this is a, a challenge, I guess, for constitutional drafters. How can they anticipate um, these this possible measures, these possible scenarios and respond to them? Um, that, that's one. And secondly, I think also the, the point you made about um, not only that uh, the um, you know there is there, there is trouble addressing the issue of disinformation at all, but the commission has not even managed to ensure balanced media coverage, even by state state owned uh, authorities. And I think uh, I particularly found interesting that some of these state authorities actually use state money to pursue legal cases against again, against critics. Um, but very interesting indeed. So you have a constitutional setup um, which has gaps and governments have taken adv advantage of that. Um, thank, thank you very much. Indeed, I'm sure there will be questions when, when, we, when we get there. Um, Professor Hajel Gueldach, do you want to come in? And uh, we, we know that t Tunisia, uh, the Tunisian constitution uh, provided a, 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 an institution um, you know, there's a dedicated commission, but this commission actually existed before the constitution was, was there. So in a way, it's, it's an interesting case study to compare how, um, you know, 
before and after the constitutional framework that has it made a difference? Um, and how has it addressed the challenge of one, ensuring balanced media coverage? And then secondly, also responding to modern challenge of uh, disinformation and, and, and misinformation. You have the floor, the virtual floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Can you see my PowerPoint? You can see it. Okay, yes, I listened. We can see it. Okay, thank you so much. I listened carefully to the colleagues and your invitees from from Ghana and from Poland, and I think that the experience of Tunisia also is very similar. However, we have some uh, specificities. So, as you said, in Tunisia. Uh, we have this independent high commission for audiovisual communication, which is called HICA in uh, French acronyms since 2011. And I will try in my presentation to tell you about five points. I will begin with the context, the evolution of the legal instruments that instituted this commission. I will tell you about the mandate and the composition of this commission. I will tell you about the added value, what are the positive points of the ICA, and I will tell you about the new challenges facing uh, this Tunisian commission and what can be the, co the recommendations. This is the website of the ICA and you can find more information on it, both on, in Arabic and in French language. So as you said from the beginning, I think that such constitutional authorities in our countries and especially in countries like Tunisia in a phase of transitional uh, democracy, uh, I think such, com uh, such um, commissions are a counter power. They have a role, they regulate, they uh, give control, they control media, and at the same time, uh, they try to make a balance with politics. Uh, against totalitarianism. And I think it's very important also to tell you that in Tunisia, it is uh, something which is new since 2011. We are the country who begins the revolution or what is called the Sp Arab Spring. And I think 10 years after we are in 2021, the only good thing in our country is that we preserve it, the uh, questions of liberty of expression and freedom of speech. This is, I think, the only only thing we had as a plus value, as a positive point after, after two new, 10 years. We have a lot of crises, such in politics, in uh, economy, we, are, we have not a good balance with the questions of terrorism. However, the only thing we defended till the uh, end was the liberty of expression and such authorities, as I said, has a rule. This is a little bit the history, even if it is tiny, but I try to explain the main important dates before 2011, we do not have any commission to regulate medias. We have in 1975, the press law, it is a, a code that does not at all give uh, liberties or guarantee liberties. And nowadays, after 2011, it was abolished and amended. So we have also this question of uh, Arabic countries or uh, African countries in general, the ones in which you have the president for 20 years, for 13 years, they need and they try to control media. So you have one party, you have one uh, vision, you have just to be careful with the words, with your uh, the things you, you, you put on uh, your radio or on your TV with your programs and everything, you have the censorship and there is a lot of influence of politics in uh, media and the liberty of expression. However, as I told you, since 2011, uh, we had something that changed totally. And with two uh, decrees, the decree of 2011, we began with the area of liberty of expression. And we have the uh, date of 3 May 2013, we instituted the commission uh, of um, the audiovisual um, Tunisian commission. And this commission, uh, as you said, it is uh, right, it's created before the constitution of 2014. However, till now, we do not have any law that organize 
the, uh, this, uh, this um, commission. For instance, it is only the decree law of 2011 that organize and give an idea about the mandates and the, the composition and the role of this commission. And in 2020, it was since one year, there was a second draft of the law that was uh, inserted in front of the parliament. However, maybe you, you have an idea that in Tunisia, since uh, 25th of July, 2021, this uh, year, this uh, summer, the president of the Republic had decided to suspend the parliament. He decided to dismiss the prime minister and he decided to change the government. So for instance, we do not have any parliament. So everything is done by decree law. This is a little bit about the framework. And uh, as I told you, I think that 10 years after, we are very proud of our uh, liberty of expression. And maybe this is the only one, the, the only success or the only positive point we had after the dictatorship of Ben Ali, the second president of Tunisia. So this is a little bit uh, a sum up of uh, what we have as uh, text, as I told you, and nowadays uh, the authority, the commission is uh, uh, having eight years old. The experience of Tunisia is young. If we compare it to other experiences, it is a young body. However, I uh, can tell you that the assessment uh, is very nice and they are doing very wonderful uh, uh, work. Number two, we'll uh, go through the composition and the role of our commission. These are the, the beginners, the first commissioners of the commission, and these are the new ones, the ones who exist now. And I can tell you about parity, gender, and I can tell you also about uh, the question of the multidisciplinarity. This is the composition. We have one judge from the administrative corps and one judicial judge. We have two judges plus three members who are nominated each by the most representative press professional organizations, the most representative audiovisual professional organization, and the most representative media editors professional organization, plus four other members who have individually submitted their applications, and they should come from the specialized fields of law, finance, social science, and press. So this composition is very nice because it is multidisciplinary and it is very important when we are dealing with controlling mass media. And we have also the question of parity between women and men. All these persons, the 11 mem members, have to be um, designated by the parliament. So, and it is done uh, as uh, I told you in 2013 by uh, the, the first parliament after the revolution. For instance, we do not have any parliament. What uh, this uh, constitutional body is do doing, what, who are they? It is independent, number one. This is a very important notion in constitutional law. These such uh, um, commissions have to be independent, neutral. It is a constitutional body. So our constitution in the article one, uh, 127, uh, they provides for an audiovisual communication commission and uh, uh, it has a constitutional value. This is very important because, as I told you, we are dealing with human rights, with, with democracy, with state of law, and these uh, things uh, have to be inserted in the Constitution. What is the mission? Mainly two things. Number one, they care and they regulate the audiovisual media landscape in Tunisia. Number two, they seek to promote a culture of modification to establish media independence. And they also give the license for the new televisions and the new radios. Uh, I can tell you that after 2011, we have such a wave of liberty and freedom, more than new 60 radios, more than new 12 TV channels in Tunisia. And this is also positive as we are encouraging the uh, liberty of expression. However, I have to tell you also that liberty of expression is a responsibility. It is not 
only a right, it is also an obligation. And you have something about ethics, something about public order. And this is also the main important mission of the independent high commission to regulate, to control, to put some assess. You cannot exceed some values, some uh, principles because of liberty of expression and liberty of, um, liberty of, uh, of freedom and of speech. So it is important also to know about our limits. And this is very important, especially that Tunisia is a country that, is, that has traditions. We are really a conservative country and we are a Muslim country. So sometimes we have some excess after 2011 and the independent high commission has a very important role to do the balance, how to give freedoms of speech liberties, but at the same time they control and they give this regulation so that we cannot exceed. Don't forget also that in Tunisia we have the context of terrorism. In 2016, we have a context of a very sensitive context of combating and fighting against terrorism. So mass media also, they have to be careful with fake news and sometimes these news can totally uh, have to instrumentalize the, the reality. Also, we can just uh, have here some uh, points of what are the missions of this commission. They can complete the terms of reference specifying duties and rights of licenses. They can monitor the compliance of establishments with these legal and behavioral conditions and take the necessary measures in case of violation of these rules, they provide the same opinion regarding the designation of heads of general managers at the head of public media institutions and all these are regulatory and disciplinary powers plus they have also advisory powers and as i told you they have a website and through the website the citizen and any uh, tunisian can go and uh, fill in the formula and they can just uh, tell the commission that there was a program in which we have hate for example speech or there is uh, something which is hurting uh, the sensitivity of the public order or something like that. So you, you see that this uh, uh, commission is in interaction with people, with Tunisian people, with people who are uh, the ones who consume television and radio. What is the added value of the Tunisian commission since its creation? Maybe I can just uh, give you, because of the time, the main important uh, advantages and positive points. They can protect freedom of expression and information. Uh, uh, the question of plurality, the diversity, a balanced audiovisual media landscape, as you said, this is the title of our workshop nowadays, uh, today, and this is very important, to reinforce the values of human rights. All the revolution in Tunisia was done for human rights, for dignity, for the minimum of human rights. So this, such uh, commissions who are just created for these issues are there to defend these uh, questions. And I can tell you that the ones who uh, are in the commission, the members of the commission, are very respectful people. They are independent. They do not have any interaction with politics. And most of them have their career in human rights, um, uh, de defense, and uh, pacifism. So number two, it should also ensure the independence of public media institutions from all forms of interference. This is very important point. Ensure the neutrality of media products and the fair distribution of audiovisual communication services and the diversity of views and opinions. This is a very important point and I will switch when I go to the challenges to tell you how they can really ensure the independence of public media institutions and they can give you the uh, the, um, the example of Nesma TV, I will tell you about that after. Because Nesma TV, uh, this is a television uh, on the head of whom there is a politician and he's compared to Berlusconi in Italy. He is uh, the one who has the second uh, more powerful party in the parliament and he is the owner of this uh, channel and he uh, didn't at all uh, regulate or uh, give some regulations on his uh, 
channel. So it is now stopped and uh, Nesma TV cannot broadcast after 25 of July because nowadays things are moving and Parliament is no more there. And this person left Tunisia and I think he's in Algeria now. Between the positive points also, Tunisia is in a process of opening up the media landscape seeking uh, to develop more independent and diverse media. And this is new for us. Before 2011, we have, as I told you, only one unique mass media, which is the national TV. And they are all the time focusing on banalities, activities, not more. Nowadays, it's very important to allow other channels, other radios to have this possibility to express themselves. However, as I told you, we have also the responsibility to stop ourselves when it is about ethics, when it is about moral, when it is about public order. So this new freedom is still threatened and several challenges continue to exist in Tunisia and I can tell you and give you some examples nowadays. At the legal level, the positive point also is that we have already trying to draft a law for the audiovisual body. Uh, they respond all the time to criticism. They try to uh, update their uh, texts. And uh, finally, we have a very important and interesting draft in 2020. However, as I told you, uh, now the parliament is locked. No parliament, for instance. So this is also a, maybe a positive point after 25 of July, 20 and 21, Haika was uh, able to uh, close and to suspend some media televisions which are in irregular situation. I told you about Nesma TV. Nesma TV, uh, the owner of Nesma TV is number two in the parliament. He is very important and very, um, how to say, powerful man in the parliament. So all the time he didn't, um, uh, he didn't allow the, the, the HICA, this commission, to do, to do uh, or to, to do its decisions, to apply its decisions. And uh, once the parliament does not exist, for instance, so we have uh, some turmoil, we, do, we are not uh, really in a very good position uh, on political side. However, maybe the, it is ongoing and the president of the Republic uh, tries to give uh, positive uh, outputs and try to give answers on how things will move in the future and maybe we will have to elect a new parliament. So uh, meanwhile, uh, as I told you, this HICA, this is the president of HICA, so the authority of our commission in Tunisia, they are able at least to, um, to do their decision, to apply their, their decisions. Now, what are the new challenges? Because of time, I just uh, focused on some uh, very uh, tiny um, uh, challenges. Number one is the question of independence. This is the most important requirement under the international standards when we are dealing with liberty of expression, liberty of media. So how such um, commissions can be independent, how they can uh, push the interference of politics, how they can uh, be uh, independent. When I told you, it's also about neutrality and it is also about resources, financial resources, human resources for our commission. They do not have enough resources. They are not able to do a lot. And that's why they are doing uh, some positive points, but not enough because of this question of um, the question of uh, means, tools. They do not have enough money and not enough people to react and to control mass media. Also the interference with politics, with uh, ministers, with the president, etc. Again, I just need to tell you that in Tunisia, we have this guarantee. People are free enough. They can express themselves. They can criticize even the president of the republic nowadays. And this is new. We didn't have that before 2011. However, we have to pay attention to the excess. Sometimes it is too much in Tunisia. Now, this is a little bit about the draft I told you about in 2020, and they need that this commission should be independent authority. They uh, put the light on its neutrality and uh, to have independent and neutral members. Also, this is uh, very important to, uh, to focus on uh, again and again. Uh, the execution of their duties, they do not have to be to have any interference from the uh, political organizations. 
this is the second uh, challenge. I choose the question of electronic media landscape and the question of the uh, online uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, all these new digital social media in which people nowadays, Tunisians and others, foreign people can express themselves um, very quickly, but again, they are very dangerous that, because you can, uh, as it is in the title of our workshop, you can have misinformation, fake news, you can instrumentalize the realities, you can put fake uh, images, you can also criticize the head of the state and put very uh, hate speech that can uh, give very negative impression of our country for the foreign countries and sometimes tourists will not come to our country. Our country is based on tourism. Uh, when you have this turmoil, when you have this uh, hate speech, when you have pictures who are fake news, etc., this is particularly not good for the image of our country. So is the commission nowadays capable, able to control all these electronic medias and the, all the online radios, the online broadcasts, the ones on YouTube, etc. And there are many, many of them are nowadays uh, available. I think uh, it is very important for the Commission to uh, maybe to uh, to have some issues, to uh, to have some solutions to control these uh, new challenges, the digital new challenges. So this is a little bit of pictures of very influent people in mass media and mass media can make opinion and public opinion can make decisions. So it's very important also to make the balance between reality and between the uh, freedom of expression. I have to conclude now to tell you that our commission has done a lot. We are in a transitional period. We are uh, having um, um, to understand how to respect human rights and state of law. It's also about mentalities. We need to, um, to believe in ourselves, to believe in our constitutional commissions and bodies. We need to give them more important um, financial and human resources so that they can go uh, further um, to reinforce the, the hard work so far uh, done. And we have a lot of ideas about the reform. These are some ideas as some recommendations to reform the public audiovisual media, to settle status of media organizations that broadcast outside the legal sphere, establishment of a unit. Yeah, I have to finish. I ha we have to establish a campaign program to ensure fair and equitable coverage of elections. This is a very important point concerning elections. We have also to uh, adapt the legislation. We do not adapt yet the legislations to meet them with the provisions with the new constitution. And above all, we need, uh, uh, um, we need a law that will be definitely the one who control and give regulation on the uh, commission and give solutions. Thank you so much for your attention. Maybe in the uh, discussion, we can uh, do more uh, to comment these uh, recommendations. Thank you so much. Th th thank you very much. Um, now we uh, we're gonna have to put a lot of pressure on Boris uh, to try and serve us some time. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Professor, for for that detailed conversation. Um, and I'm sure there will be some questions. Um, then we'll we'll come back to that. Uh, Boris, you have the floor. Tell us about uh, about Armenia. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this year, Armenia celebrated the uh, 30th anniversary of um, its um, independence. And we have a tradition to adopt um, uh, changes in the constitution every 10 years. So um, in 2015, uh, we had the third edition of the constitution. And although it was named amendments to the constitution, but the changes were huge. And um, it's enough to say that uh, after these changes, Armenia was transformed from um, semi-presidential to parliamentary republic. And of course, this change uh, affected also the um, uh, regulation of the um, uh, Commission on TV and Radio, which is constitutional body here. 
since we are again in the process of uh, amending the constitution and um, uh, by the decision of the government, a special commission is formed. So maybe this time we will have uh, another amendments even uh, sooner than in 10 years. And since uh, we are in, the, in this process, uh, I want to first of all, uh, focus on those um, uh, challenges that we still see in the constitution. The first one is uh, probably um, abstract. It is about a very declarative statement in the constitution than the national regulator, Commission on TV and Radio, uh, um, uh, has a mission of uh, protecting freedom of media which uh, in a certain extent um, uh, uh, is in conflict with the real uh, function of the commission since the commission is uh, providing licenses, organizing competition, following that the uh, broadcasters are not um, uh, violating uh, the laws and um, uh, enacts punishment if this happens. Um, uh, and if it comes to the protection of certain rights, then I would say that the mission of the commission is rather protecting of rights of the public, or in other words, uh, rights of the consumers, rather than uh, the rights of the media. And the second problem is um, a more essential, and it is about uh, the formation of the national regulator and um, ensuring that it is uh, sufficiently independent. Uh, according to our constitution, the uh, national regulator consists of uh, seven members, and all of them are appointed by the National Assembly, the parliament. And given that the nomination um, and voting is taking place um, first in the profile commission, uh, standing commission or, or committee of the, uh, of the parliament that then goes to the plenary, and given that uh, we have um, a very strong uh, parliamentary majority now, it is clear that the next uh, nominations and the next voting that will take place in December for three vacancies in the commission will for sure be uh, politically motivated and the parliamentary majority will have a chance to uh, nominate and appoint those people who are loyal. And unfortunately, this is um, tradition in Armenia. Uh, in all previous years, uh, the decision of the commission uh, of the, of the, uh, of the government when appointing the members of the commission and decision of the commission uh, during the competitions for licensing were politically motivated. And this brought to a very uh, strange situation in, the, in 2018 when we had Velvet Revolution and change of the government when a majority of TV companies were belonging to the previous authorities. And so they were uh, opposition uh, to the government. And this uh, strong political fight um, in the uh, information sphere um, brought to uh, huge flaws of uh, disinformation, fake news, and other uh, propaganda content. Uh, in fact, we, we can say that we have inform in, we still have information war in our uh, broadcasting sphere. And um, of course, the constitution has to have some uh, direction for the uh, changes in the legislation. Uh, the main legislation that uh, regulates the operation of um, uh, broadcast, broadcast media in Armenia is um, the law on audiovisual media. And despite the ambitious name that was chosen uh, during the discussion on the law last year, uh, it still um, regulates only um, uh, traditional uh, broadcast media, uh, those uh, who have uh, terrestrial broadcasting and those who are uh, in the um, cable uh, packages. And for the uh, terrestrial um, the broadcasting, uh, we still have a problem with that law since it's pro it does not provide for sufficient uh, conditions for appearance of alternative or private uh, multiplex operator. Continuously in Armenia, the monopoly for the terrestrial broadcasting belongs to the public 
uh, multiplex operator or state-owned multiplex, multiplex operators. And there is uh, almost no chance uh, for any other, given the regulations in the law, any other to appear and provide broader uh, possibility for uh, potential uh, broadcasters. While terrestrial broadcasting is still very important in the country for the influence, for the influencing the uh, public opinion. And especially this is true for the remote areas in the Armenia where um, our citizens mostly view television and uh, create their perception of the uh, social political situation uh, through the content that they are uh, that uh, they are receiving. Uh, at the same time last year when the law on audio audiovisual media was adopted there was one positive step which uh, could be further developed um, I'm saying further developed because uh, it is still in a very experimental stage. And this is uh, the, the, the attempt to combine uh, a state regulation with the self-regulation. And the way it is um, being done is that all uh, the uh, TV companies or radio companies that are applying for licensing and uh, or for authorization we have licensing for those who want to uh, be included in the public multiplex. And uh, authorization is for those, it is without competition. It is, uh, it is open and very simple procedure. It is for being included, uh, included in the cable uh, packages. Uh, so um, any of uh, those companies who uh, want to be authorized or be licensed, uh, need to uh, join certain self-regulation system, which means that they either have to join some uh, voluntarily emerged um, uh, self-regulation in me media self-regulation initiatives or have their own ombudsman and also have a code of ethics and the procedures um, uh, of, for, for enforcement of this code of ethics. This means that the national regulator can um, take measures uh, regarding the content of um, uh, broadcast uh, product, bro broadcasted product, only if there is a major uh, and direct violation of laws, uh, such as propaganda of racism, discriminations, uh, discrimination, and uh, things like that. Um, but when it comes to, let's say, mixed um, legal ethical issues, before taking any measures, uh, the national regulator needs to have a conclusion of the self-regulation institution. And um, this, uh, according to uh, our opinion, has to be developed as interesting um, um, uh, experiment. Uh, because um, uh, as uh, the practice in Armenia proved, uh, only through um, quality content and through, um, through ethical journalism and through uh, self-regulation, it is possible to effectively uh, fight um, um, uh, with disinformation because any, let's say, administrative uh, methods are uh, not that effective or or take to the situation when there is a pressure on freedom of expression. Um, that's probably uh, what I wanted to stress on. And given that you wanted to restrict my freedom of speech, <laughs> I stop here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Th thank you very much, Boris. I was actually very, very useful, especially the last point you made. Um, I think you still have that confidence that self-regulation uh, can do the job. Uh, you know, self-regulation self was designed in the context of traditional media, but you believe that even under the current context that that could be valuable. And of course, you are also speaking as, as a journalist yourself, uh, which, 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 is, which is an important perspective to, to think about. But thank you very much. That was that was that was very very useful. Um, we still have, luckily, we still have some time. And um, uh, Christina, you, you've you've raised some questions already in the in the chat, uh, and I saw that Professor uh, Hajer has has responded. But I'll open it up. If anybody has any questions uh, to any of our panelists, uh, please um, bring it on. Um, otherwise, I can I can ask 
uh, Hajar, maybe if she wants to add on uh, to, to add on what she she wrote uh, on on the chat. Uh, questions are on. Anybody interested? Anybody with any questions? Go go ahead. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you. I'm always curious about, you know, if you would step back and look at these institutions, um, how would you change them? Um, I think people like Adam already know I'm a bit of a skeptic about constitutional commissions and so on, because it feels to me they're so often captured. Um, and I see that Terence's question in the chat is sort of along similar lines. He there suggests that you try and have a balance, a bit like the Germans do for their constitutional court in appointments to these commissions, having opposition and majority sort of contributing. I mean, I would worry about that as I am a South African and I come from a one party dominant system. So that wouldn't help us. Um, I thought, was it you, Kwasi, who talked about, or, or perhaps Hadja, the uh, appointments which come from different sectors? But so that's sort of bundling two different issues together. Can one ever escape capture? I mean, capture whether by parallel institutions, as we've heard, or just by capture of the membership, firstly. Um, and secondly, you know, how would you answer Taryn's question? What do you think is the strongest appointment mechanism? Thank you very much, Christian. I, th I think, and maybe Boris can correct me, in uh, Armenia, there is actually a requirement that um, candidates must receive 60% support, three-fifths support. Um, and, and, and perhaps I think it, it may be an interesting area that, that uh, you, may, you may wish to speak about. And indeed, it is a broader challenge. Uh, how do you ensure, uh, especially in countries where there are dominant parties, how do you ensure that these commissions uh, will actually not legitimize whatever the government does and actually do their job? of ensuring balance and, and, and addressing challenges of uh, misinformation. But this is a question, I guess, for all the panelists. Um, so she, if, um, if any of you would like to, to address that, please go ahead. Boris, is, 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 like, do, do you think from your experience in Armenia, has the uh, higher or, or the super majority requirement, has it helped? Uh, in terms of ensuring a better independence? Um, I, I saw raised hands, that is why I was reluctant to start myself, but anyway, uh, I don't think that in our case it works because uh, in fact the uh, parliamentary majority has much more votes than th three fifths. And so um, uh, uh, through our experience during um, uh, last years, when it comes to the uh, election of um, uh, members of uh, similar regulatory bodies like um, uh, Supreme uh, Judicial uh, Council or any other, um, the, the, the leading uh, political party managed to uh, pass uh, those candidates that uh, they, 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 they were interested in. And uh, again, I'm sure that in uh, December, December elections of three new uh, members of the commission, um, uh, they will uh, do the same, especially that the political situation in Armenia is very tense. And the government is uh, very much interested to control communication, communication sphere as much as it is possible uh, mm -hmm. to protect uh, their, 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 their uh, power. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and if we uh, come back to the situation which we had um, in May this year, when we had um, an, uh, the last um, um, competitions for the licensing, uh, there was, I would say, uh, even a scandal in the um, Commission on TV and Radio, when uh, five members were voting uh, very much differently to the two others. And their scores for the applicant were so much different that it raised serious uh, professional um, uh, challenges, um, uh, whether they were objective or just following um, this or that political interests. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, that after the, um, we will have new composition of um, 
of the of the commission we will have a continuation of that practice okay. and uh, in any situation when the pro government uh, pro government broadcasters um, uh, would uh, have specific interest this interest will be protective and uh, contrary to that uh, let's say um, not controlled by the government uh, uh, channels uh, will suffer Thank, thank you very much. Interesting. So basically, I think we have to think about different ways and perhaps as Tarun suggests and, and Christina also notes, uh, trying to kind of have direct role of opposition forces, regardless of the size of a majority that a party has, maybe, maybe an idea. So we have three hands. Um, now before I come to you, Professor Robluski, I'm going to ask um, I Plebani, uh, and then Kimana and then Yinebeb um, in that order. Please go ahead. Uh, P.E. Plebani. Sorry, I, uh, I come out of uh, darkness. Uh, my name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Plebani. I work Hi, at Free... Elizabeth. Hi, I work at Free Press Unlimited. Um, I'm a for... It's a Dutch NGO and uh, uh, deals with uh, media development. Um, I'm a former, I mean, I've always feel a journalist, but I, I have to say a former journalist. The last 10 years, I've not worked as a journalist, but with journalists. So I had a question. Um, um, I have worked uh, myself in former Soviet Union uh, in different countries, and uh, so I have experienced what, what it means, let's say, the transition uh, from uh, a system into another system. And now I'm uh, uh, involved in conflict uh, zones in, in areas where actually they either build from scratch because they don't have any uh, examples and tradition in that, or because it has been destroyed somehow. So for, for a moment, if I may, uh, with this uh, knowledgeable uh, uh, crowd here, uh, try to get out of the inside, so the mechanism, uh, the membership appointment and all these things, and looking at the outside, I mean, how far uh, can you share examples of, um, have you done any um, uh, efforts in changing that mentality that Hajar I think uh, has mentioned, I mean, it's also a question of mentality in believing in understanding uh, that freedom is not only, uh, you know, a right, it's also responsibility and how to uh, regulate and how to protect the media and at the same time uh, maintain it uh, as independent as possible. So um, efforts in uh, taking also the public, the audience right, the access to information aspect in how uh, the public can protect also the institutions, not only uh, who holds power and only the uh, the parliaments and and so on so how inclusive these systems need to be are and uh, are giving um let's say results in empowering uh, raising awareness maybe, maybe media literacy it's also a form of protecting and uh, and uh, sustain them so i would like to hear from i don't have an exact person to ask to but uh, i guess a hajar has uh, uh, maybe some experience and and definitely uh, well, I, I'm more known with the former Soviet Union than for Africa. So, but please come, uh, come if you can with examples. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's essentially about the mandate. Do they have a promotional preventive mandate rather than just monitoring and then punishing and, and all of that? Yeah, but uh, also what you do around, advocate yeah. for it. How you yeah. communicate about this commission? How how do people understand and know that exists this this commission? Because. Uh, I know that many people are very active inside and they do a lot of work, but how much is known outside also to protect these institutions and this mechanism? Thank you. Uh, Kimana, and then we'll go to the panelists for a round of uh, calls. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. I have two questions. The first one is actually very much related to what Ms. Pavani just said. Um, I wondered how, public, how publicly visible these commissions are. Um, and also, since I have an interest also in understanding how these commissions are working um, towards dealing with, with online uh, mis and disinformation, whether there's a pressure from the public also to expand the mandate of these, of these commissions in any substantive way that, way that would actually help them uh, deal with, with, the, with these phenomena. My second question is, is more to Christina, but I'm also really interested in hearing Professor Prempe's thoughts. Um, and it is about the fact that uh, what Christina said about commissions um, very often being captured. Um, but we've also heard from Professor Prempe that um, actually the authorities in, in Ghana created this National Commun uh, Communications Authority, right? Um, which would be basically a, a maybe a regulatory body, which is clearly controlled by the government as it was created by the government, right? And I was wondering, 
Christina or Professor Prempe, what, what, what do you think about what kind of institution would be in a better position on the one hand, not to be captured, uh, but on the other hand, also to, to, have, a, to have a role in actually dealing with uh, protecting freedom, freedom of expression, but also dealing with, with, this, uh, with this information and, and these sorts of phenomena. If it's not a, an independent sort of an independent commission, um, also other institutions can be captured. There are institutions that are created by the government. Um, so what's the alternative? Thanks. Thank you very much, Kimana. I think we, we've noted that. And what I would do is maybe for to, for ease, uh, we'll go to uh, to Kwasi and then and then go in the direction. Um, and you can answer whichever question you wish, wish to, and we'll finalize uh, after that. Uh, Hajar, I know that you have you have a class. So if you must leave, uh, you we will be you know we, we excuse you already. We, we're grateful, uh, but of course no, we'll be glad to have you. Five minutes, I can. Uh, perfect, just perfect. Yeah. Uh, Professor Prempe, go ahead, please. Sure. So um, on the appointments or the composition of the Ghana Commission, I think when you look at the other constitutional commissions, the independent commissions, we have an electoral commission, we have a national uh, civic education, um, commission on civic education, we have the independent, uh, I mean, the Supreme Audit Institution, the Auditor General's Office, and we have a commission for human rights and administrative justice. When you look at the mode of appointment, the media commission is the only one actually with this structure, with this, with this composition. All the other ones, are, are the, the commissioners are appointed by the president. Uh, vacancies on the commission are filled almost single-handedly by the president. There is a consultation with a council of state that is an advisory body to the president, and, and that's it. It's only with the National Media Commission that you have the president and parliament, the political half of the state, uh, having um, a, a, a only one third of the membership uh, um, allocated to them. And the rest of them are to be appointed by specifically designated um, civil society-like kinds of institutions, the Ghana, I mean, the Bar Association, the Journalist Association, Association of Media Owners. Um, interestingly, and, and this is a bit controversial depending on what issue there is, uh, the, the, the two religious uh, bodies are, are actually named. There's a one for Christian, one for Muslim. Those are the only ones named uh, on the membership. But it, it, it at least gives them um, a structure that is independent of the government. And I think in practice, I think Christina is right that even with the structure, um, government capture or state capture is still possible. Uh, you can, you just, you only have to go to the various nominating bodies and then do your politics there and you can, you can still get the numbers, but at least um, it's not as easy to do as you would get with the electoral commission where the government single handedly appoints. So I think in the Ghana case, the structure itself is not problematic. I think what has happened is that the framers of the constitution certainly did not anticipate the, the technological revolution uh, that would come just on the heels of uh, the, the adoption of the constitution. And also, even if they did, I mean, they left, so there's a catch-all phrase in the in the list of the functions of the commission, there is, uh, in the constitution, there is this last provision that says, and they may perform such other functions as may be prescribed by law, right, by statute. And so nothing in this constitution precludes our media commission from being assigned the task that have been assigned the National Communications Authority, except that nothing compels a government to do so. so the first government uh, comes to power and takes advantage of this gap and decides to create a statutory body that is then given some other functions uh, of probably substantially more power. The moment you move away from the state-owned uh, broadcast model to the new regime in which we are with private media as well as internet, then the media commission's kind of role becomes a bit diminished. And that's what has happened, that it's been overtaken by events and the NCA has become the substantially more powerful body and the media commission has become quite subdued. 
You know, so yes, there is still, I mean, between the two institutions, they continue to fight for TEF, but uh, to all intents and purposes, the NCA is the bigger, is the bigger player in the picture. And, and I don't see that changing anytime soon because of the nature of the politics and the political economy around it. It's not likely to change. But um, I think, you know, if I had other institutions, uh, the Electoral Commission and other bodies were similarly composed, I think people would have a lot more trust in their independence. Um, so in terms of the composition, I don't have a problem with it. It's mostly the mandate that I think, uh, given the technology, appears to have considerably diminished. Thank, thank you very much. Um, in, in, interesting point, I think, and, and, and Christina is actually writing. So you know, there's appointment mechanisms, there is funding, and there is now, from what we heard from uh, Ghana and, uh, and Poland, essentially establishing parallel institutions to undermine uh, co constitutional bodies. And are there any solutions? Well, th that's, that's a difficult one, but, uh, but at least we have gotten to the stage where we have identified uh, some, of, some of the challenges. Uh, Professor Mirslow, do you, do you want to go ahead? If you, have, uh, if you have any points to make in relation to any of the questions? Professor, I think you are, yes. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, uh, so uh, actually I uh, would like to, to answer the question posed by, by Christina uh, regarding the, the uh, commissions being captured. Yes, indeed, but uh, 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 the constitutional guarantees uh, are, uh, are strong. Uh, then the political uh, authorities uh, uh, may find different uh, venues like the one which was used in Poland to exempt a part of the responsibilities from the commission, violating uh, still uh, the constitution. But this is a, uh, when uh, the members of the uh, media commission have a constitutionally granted uh, term, the uh, exemption of some uh, of some uh, tasks is unfortunately a method to uh, politically control some parts of the media of the media market, and uh, of course the, the, then the, there is a, a constitutional court which is either unable to enforce its judgments or. Uh, is politically controlled, which of course puts a question of who is the ultimate guardian of the of the constitution. But I think it's a it's a question for a separate seminar. Uh, so I would just like to 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 uh, yes to answer and say this is a very important point, and I don't think we we found uh, effective counter measures yet. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Indeed, um, I, I think, but at least we have identified an issue and, and hopefully uh, the next process will, will engage in that. Uh, Hajar? Yeah, very quickly. Thank you so much. I like the very um, uh, nice uh, questions of Elizabeth and Kiman and also the ones uh, wrote by uh, Christina, and I will try to respond with a synthetic point of view, as our uh, country, Tunisia, is in Africa, and it is an Arabic country, and such human rights questions are very sensitive. So we made really a lot of, uh, um, how to say, changed mentalities so that we can um, have this plus value, these positive points nowadays, and it was because of the revolution of 2011. I told you before, we do not are able even to express ourselves um, uh, with freedom. So number one, maybe the questions are about the question of independence and the question of visibility of such commissions. So number one, I think that everything depends on the political will. 
If you have the political will in a country, everything will move very quickly. If you do not have, you will have a lot of obstacles, challenges to these commissions, and as if it is a vitrine. We are in a, a democracy, but it is not really a democracy. So I think there is very important point, which is the political will to make some change and to allow these commissions to do their control and regulation mandate. Number two, the role of civil society. In Tunisia, the civil society is very strong. It is very strong. They have the Nobel Prize in 2015. The associations defending human rights are everywhere. The weight of the street, when you are upset with something, with a solution, with a decision, whatever, people are in the streets to express themselves and it works. And this is very important. Youth nowadays in Africa, in all Africa, we have also to uh, negotiate. We have to uh, listen to our people, to African people, to Tunisian people when they are not um, okay with your point of view. We have to adhere to this tolerance and this is very important. Number three, the role of experts. We need also to have recommendations. We, have, we need also to know about the um, uh, the, the positive uh, point of view of these experts that can already give us uh, an idea about the best practices on the basis of comparative experiences and to draft the laws so that we can defend and control such commissions. And after that, I have to move to question of visibility and give you an idea about our commission. Haika has a very nice website and you can hear, it's very easy for people. They can just go to this red color and they have, it is, uh, sorry, uh, anyway, they can have here a formula. And in this formula, it's very quick. So every people, everyone, every person have a mobile, even the modest people. And they can quickly, if they observe something which is not good on their television, or they listen to something which is uh, opposite to the moral or to the public order, or they discover some misinformation or some instrumentalization, they just have to fill in this very easy formula. Also, our commission do a lot of advertisement. They are very visible. They are very famous. We know about it. Everybody knows about it, even the youth. And uh, they put just some very, sli very light spots so that they can uh, give an idea to people on their roles, on their mandates with cartoons, something like that. It's very easy to people to know about it and to know also how a pe how persons, this is e-democracy, this is how you involve people in decisions, in controlling mass media, in controlling the, the, value, uh, the values that we have on our TVs and radios. I'm sorry to tell you that, but here in Tunisia, 10 years after, we have the extremism in everything. We are in extreme positions and we need to uh, wake up. As I told from the beginning, liberties and freedom does not mean extremism and non-tolerance and you go till the excess. You need to regulate, you need to have some balance. This is very important. And our um, Haika, for instance, this is a very good example and you can just visit to the website and you can see all the huge efforts they are doing with no human resource, with no financial resource. That gives you an idea that the volunteer is there, that we need some change and we uh, build some change. And maybe uh, again, they have only eight years old, but I think that this is the beginning and we need just to put the pieces of this uh, democracy and uh, I think one day it will be better and we can improve the work. But if you do not have the political will and the changement of the mentalities, you cannot have access to this positive results. This is very important. We've done that in Tunisia, but if we, I go to Egypt, to Morocco, to our neighbors, I can tell you that they do not have at all the same configuration and they have a lot of pressure on their media and they do not have any a commission that regulate and control uh, the, the freedom of speech. So at least we are a unique example, a good example in the Arabic countries. And we need to encourage enough these commissioners and to give them uh, enough resources so that they can do a better work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Boris, you have the last word again. Uh, uh, thanks. First of all, I would like to uh, respond to uh, the question about um, uh, 
an existence of requests for strengthening the role of the national regulators. I think it exists, and um, uh, this is not good news sometimes, uh, because uh, this is uh, rather a request for censorship, rather the request for, uh, let's say, uh, um, effective regulation. Unfortunately, this um, domination of fake news in the information sphere, uh, this, um, uh, raises, this raises anxious anxiety among the, among the population and people want to punish those uh, who uh, they dislike as uh, trans, um, uh, transmitters of information. And um, when they know, and in Armenia, most of the people know that there is a national regulator and they want that this national regulator is very strict towards the media, towards the journalists and other who disseminate information. So um, I, see, I see a real solution here in development of such institutions as media literacy and self-regulation that would balance this request for censorship and uh, the a request for quality information. Um, um, now about capturing the, the national regulator, I think this capture uh, has uh, two levels. One level is um, when the members of uh, such kind of uh, national regulators are uh, appointed or elected. And here um, we try, uh, tried in Armenia different methods to exclude uh, politically motivated uh, decisions here, like um, suggesting public hearings about the candidacies. Um, uh, this is very important because in our law, it is um, stipulated that the members of the national regulator should be people who are well known as experts in the area of uh, broadcasting, journalism, uh, law, culture, education. However, there is no clear criteria. There are no clear criteria. What does it mean? And for this, I think uh, kind of public hearings with, which could ensure people now or, and the society that uh, those people are really the um, best representatives among of the candidates uh, who could um, uh, work independently and professionally in the national regulator. Um, another option uh, was the provision in our previous law on TV and radio, which um, uh, stipulated that for any applicants for the position in the national regulator, they needed recommendations from civil society organizations. And again, it was some kind of ambiguity which civil society organizations could uh, give such recommendations because we have about 5,000 of CSOs in a small country. Uh, so I think certain criteria should exist uh, what kind of uh, NGOs and with uh, how it could be proved that they are established and independent entities uh, could give these recommendations. Otherwise, this mechanism is not working. And uh, finally, um, finally, I think um, uh, there should be a certain um, uh, clarity in how diversity in the membership should be achieved, uh, both political and professional diversity. And this is also something that has to be uh, probably discussed, um, not in, uh, during the um, uh, reform of the constitution, but during the discussions in the amendments to the law, which will happen soon because uh, there is a clear request that all audiovisual media is regulated and not just the traditional one. And the second level of capture is um, a much more uh, complicated case because even uh, those people who seem to be elected in a fair pro um, procedure uh, feel more comfortable if appearing in the national regulator on other similar bodies, if they are loyal to the government. There are many mechanisms to ensure such kind of loyalty, unfortunately, in a transitional democracies. And uh, this is much more complicated issue because uh, this, uh, this challenge could be uh, um, met adequately with the development of culture. Yeah, with democratic culture. And this is, I think, a wrong way for countries like my country and maybe 
some others which are represented in this panel. Um, th thank you very much, Boris. I think if I can summarize, I will, I'll never do it justice. Um, but there's a, it's a combination of thinking uh, clear, cleverly to design the institutions properly, but also it's very important that there is a context within which these institutions will be operating. And, and however good the designs are, if those circumstances do not exist, uh, they, they could be problematic. And I think Christina will probably be shaking her head because she says these institutions are needed in places where they cannot function properly. Uh, and, and, and they, they you know, and, and that is, I think, the dilemma. How can you have institutions that need to be independent in places where independence is unlikely uh, to, be, to be found? That's, that's a dilemma. Um, but I want to thank you very much. Um, I think we've, we've learned a lot about the case studies and, and there's a lot of stuff that we need to think about. Uh, but we really, really appreciate the time and we've kept you for, for very, very long already. Uh, Kimana, do you want to officially close it? I officially close it by saying thank you so very much to the panelists and also to the, to the participants for so interesting questions. Uh, to Adam for, for his wonderful moderation and to Sharon Hickey for her uh, behind the scenes um, assistance without which this would not be possible. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did and uh, hopefully see you very soon again.